I'm going to begin here. Um, so I assigned for this class uh, Leaf by Niggle and also uh, the Monsters and the Critics. Um, and I'm not, and I'm not going to spend the whole class doing that. I sort of summarized very briefly Leaf by Niggle last time and talked about it as uh, part of Tolkien's process of writing and how he viewed himself and the significance of, uh, of literature and even the enterprise of writing. And, uh, um, and is to some degree his very humble view of what the artist does. Privileged on the one hand, because he really does apprehend the beautiful and the true and the good and is able to articulate it, but very humble in the sense that he uh, is involved in what he called sub-creation. And uh, he's, not, um, he's not doing what uh, later authors do, certainly in the romantic vein of thinking that we are primary creators in that sense. But there is real creation going on. It's, it's sub called sub-creation for a reason. And um, I think this is very interesting and, uh, and helpful, particularly in the context of a debate about uh, the study of literature and, um, and writing and how human nature is involved in that. And I, I weighed in on a, uh, that a bit last time in relation to uh, the text in Genesis, where Adam names the animals and uh, the significance uh, there. And I, I find myself, as I usually do in my classes, talking about subject matter overlapping. So while I'm doing Paradise Lost in my one class, I'm thinking about Tolkien and vice versa. So it's in a year in the classes as well, but I see there's so much, there is a lot of overlap there. Uh, but I wanted to talk about the monsters and the critics because it relates to the poem Beowulf. And uh, I'm not going to get into Beowulf per se. Uh, other than to say that, that Tolkien actually did translate the poem, but never published it, uh, or held on to it for many years, and saw that it was very important. But this lecture that he gave, uh, The Monsters and the Critics, um, very much shows where Tolkien, the scholar, stands in relation to uh, his metier as, a, as an academic, as a as a writer, as a critic, um, but also shows how much the story of Beowulf informs his own, uh, the landscape, if you will, of his poem, The Lord of the Rings. Um, because he laments in The Monsters and the Critics that the, uh, the poem itself has largely been ignored by scholarship. And it is been left to archaeologists and philologists, of which he is one, uh, to talk about the significance of the poem, but they're just sort of cannibalizing the text. And they're not interested in it as a, as a myth, as a work of literature. And Tolkien thinks that there's a greatness to the poem that is not being acknowledged uh, by the critics, and it's his aim uh, to give an apology or an apologetic approach to the Beowulf poem. And what it, of particular interest, and he thinks, is an epic subject matter is uh, the death and defeat of the great hero Beowulf uh, and, and his kingdom, for that matter, which has a very uh, interesting context there. And, and one of the th things that the critics complain about is that it mixes Christian ideas with pagan ideas. So Beowulf will say that he's telling an old story um, and that he will, he will cite a, cre a creator and he will cite the story of Cain. Uh, and it's clear that he is a Christian then. He has acquaintance with Christianity, but he's telling a story from the past that happened to pagans um, and talks about how God has girded the earth with the seas and hung the sun in the sky and, um, 
and talked about these things, but there's no interest uh, if it's a Christian poet, the Christian poet doesn't put Christian values into the mouths of the characters. So there's no modesty about Beowulf. There's no humility about Beowulf, the pagan. Um, they boast about their valorous deeds. They stick, if you recall, Grendel's arm gets thrown on the wall. And uh, they want treasure, and they delight in treasure and, and worldliness. And when Beowulf dies, there's no mention of a heavenly reward for him. Uh, not, not even mentioned, not thought of, not considered. His death is, that's the end of it, that's the last word. So even though the poet in some sense has a Christian framework or it uses Christian language, Christian references. So obviously he's acquainted with Christianity, must be. The story itself remains very much uh, in, in a sort of a pagan framework. And, um, and there's a sense of doom that comes with this. So the, if you read Beowulf, I, I do it in first year English, uh, there's a sense that Beowulf, after 50 years of kingship, uh, is going to leave a kingdom unprotected. By dying, yes, he will slay the dragon, which is the great imminent threat, but he will leave his kingdom open to the tribes around him who, will, who threaten basically to come in and carve up the kingdom. So all the things that he uh, lived for and died for, he's not going to be holed off anyway. And there's a lot of lament, lamentation, a sense of loss, a sense of valor, yes, but a sense of imminent doom. And that sense of imminent doom lends greatness to the poem. It's, it's, not, it's not the Greco-Roman ideal of, of triumph, it's a sort of sense of the long inevitable defeat that, that pervades the Beowulf poem. And Tolkien says that there is something still great about this. It's very much of a Norse way of uh, presenting things, though, and thinking about things, an Anglo-Saxon worldview. So if you've, uh, the Marvel action movies, the Ragnarok, the, the inevitable destruction of all things, um, that is the view of, of the North, the Northern paganism. Southern, not so much. There's Elysian fields and paradise and so forth. Even in the underworld, there's a sense of, of glory ahead. Uh, not so the Norse, and not so the Anglo-Saxons. And uh, for T Tolkien, who wants to write a mythology for uh, Britain, the question is, where does he fall on this? And he, he tends to lean towards the North and loves the northernness, and so does Lewis. And so remember when I last semester talked about uh, the last battle, it's not a triumphalistic ending to the story. In fact, in the last battle, the last king of Narnia is constantly being defeated by even when the children come to his aid, they can't help. So it's very much against the tone of the other epics. It's, it is the last things and it is going to go down in a, a sense of, of ruin and destruction. And I spoke then about the, uh, in that lecture, about the Deus absconditus, the sense that God is hidden from us. It's not that he's absent, but he's hidden. And that sense of the hiddenness of God in the presence of apparent earthly destruction, I think also pervades Tolkien's uh, vision. There is a sense, though there's no mention of God, that, there are, that the events are being watched and also directed in some sense. So the ring was meant to be found. And that means that you were meant to find it. And you know that's a comforting thought for all of the, the uh, pain that this will provide and all of the sense of doom that comes from the ring of power and the fact that Sauron is now taken on a form in Barad-dûr as he once did in days of yore and is, is bent on subduing all, of, all flesh to his power and seems like he cannot be stopped there's still a faint hope, uh, a fool's hope. So again, the idea that there's a hidden purpose of God in all of these things and what happens, and, and Gandalf regularly points to that. And that, I think, is in more in keeping with the Beowulf uh, tone, if you will. So when, when the 
when the dead die in the Lord of the Rings, there isn't a sense that they're going to heaven. Uh, there's, no, there's no prayer, there are no temples, there's no religion. Uh, and yet there is a sense that God is there in the same sense that it is in the Beowulf uh, poem. So there is a sort of a, some Christianity in it, but he doesn't want to inject too much. Because I think, again, he's speaking to his contemporary era, and they have a strong sense of uh, what Oswald Spengler called the decline and fall of the West. Well uh, read and much lamented work in the early 1920s, I think it was. It might be eight, 1919, I can't recall. But the decline and fall of the West. A sense that, that the uh, world was coming crashing down. And the Second World, World, Second World War did not take away that sense of doom. And yet Tolkien himself went to war, the First World War, and lost all of his friends, basically, uh, as, did to as did Lewis, who was wounded there. And both of them thought that it was important to fight, and yet saw the fight. The enemies not only were on the other side of the battle lines, but in the camp. And, and that's clear what we saw with Lewis in the last work we looked at, that hideous strength. How uh, we saw the educational establishment was part, was under the, under the sway uh, of the principalities and powers, creating a modern Tower of Babel. That's what that hideous strength refers to, is that Tower of Babel. Uh, and what is the nature of the Tower of Babel? Well, it's uh, humanity trying to pull itself up by its own bootstraps and build humanity up so that it is uh, godlike, trying to lay hold of the Tao even while rejecting the Tao. And, and Tolkien is, is committed to the same sort of vision and will include the supernatural with, within that. Um, and it's very much, so I said there's no religion in it, but the supernatural is very much a part of Tolkien's presentation. We have Gandalf, one of the Istari, uh, or the, the order of the Noldor that is uh, dedicated to opposing Sauron. Uh, Sauron, who was uh, one of uh, a more, an earlier iteration of evil's deputies, namely Melkor. Melkor was a greater enemy and he had been defeated. Sauron, his deputy, is now in his place. If you're watching Amazon's Rings of Power, I talk a bit about that, although I am nothing if not critical of that series. For reasons you'd have to watch me, my take on it. I don't want to get into talking about that uh, rather than talking. Um, but um, what is being described is, the, is a whole legendarium of, of stories that begin with an account of the fall and with the gradual um, extinction of the, uh, of the elves. So the elves are going to leave Middle Earth and that, that's the context of the Lord of the Rings. That's when the battle takes place. Uh, it's the question of whether the elves are going to bother to stand and fight or whether they're going to go into the West and uh, return to their ancestral homes. Now, these elves that we're dealing with are, to some degree, rebe rebel elves for all of that. They've been deceived. They've, they've stayed behind rather than go where they're supposed to be. So that part of the challenge when you read The Lord of the Rings is that you don't have the sense of the backdrop with which to interpret the elves. You need the Silmarillion to do that. Um, and get the sense that they're like uh, the like men, and they're sort of cousins. But the difference between them is that the elves are immortal, whereas men are mortal. And the mortality is what connects them to Beowulf, and it's also part of their gift. And this is interesting that death itself can be seen as a sort of a mercy or a gift. Um, because all of them are subject to the, to the fall and to evil. Even the elves are attracted by the ring of power and, and are to some extent corrupted in their 
their beings by virtue of the fact that they um, are under the sway of, of evil and have been, to some degree, uh, co-opted. Um, they're not entirely pure anymore, and, and nobody in Middle Earth is. But they are, uh, nonetheless, willing to fight and resist that. Uh, but it's not for their day. So the, the age of the elves is coming to an end. Then will be the age of men only. But that's at the end of The Lord of the Rings. It's right at the end. And that story of the age of men will then be the account that is given in scripture, more or less. So just in terms of timeline, I think you need to realize that that's what Tolkien has in mind. That the, that the, the age that he's talking about is a sort of a pre-biblical narrative that it contains little glimmers of uh, the necessity of atonement and the necessity of redemption and uh, and the fact that the 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 one who will do the atonement is is a king and also a priest and also a prophet all of the three being features of, of Jesus the prophet priest and king in Christian theology we call it the munus triplex I don't know if you've heard of this before. Have you heard of this before? Have they ever talk about this in your theology classes? Of course not. Do they, don't they? No? We'll look it up. All you need to do is put up, up the word and then you'll see it. So in the in the in the Old Testament, you see uh, You see the importance of kingship. You see David. You see the Aaronic priesthood and the Levites that fall in that. And then you get the sense of the prophets that uh, the age of the prophets that come when Israel is um, rebelling against God and be, is being threatened with exile and then speaks even in the context of exile. All three of those are way, God's ways of uh, incarnating himself, if you will, and speaking to his people. And we can see that in the Lord of the Rings as well, that there is a, a prophetic figure um, who is probably Gandalf. And to some degree, the, the lore that he learns, the wisdom literature that he passes on, although he's not the only one who does that. There's obviously a kingly figure in the figure of Aragorn, son of Arathorn, um, and the line of men, the lineage of men, and of course, there is a sort of priestly figure, but it's not here explicit because there is no temple yet and there's no formal religion for that matter. Um, so that's the one thing that is missing here is I think the, the sense of a priestly activity. Uh, so what we don't get in the Lord of the Rings, interestingly, unlike the pagan uh, stories of the Greco-Romans, for instance, is any sacrifices to the gods. It's just not there. Well, it's not Beowulf either. He doesn't, doesn't talk about it. There's no sense of religion in there, which is a funny old thing because I, I maintain and he maintained that Tolkien is nothing if not Catholic. And <laughs> obviously the role of the priest in that is extraordinarily important. And that's the whole, the letter to the Hebrews is focused on the high priestly office of, of Jesus. Um, but you can already see in the, in the way Tolkien constructs his story, those that come to the aid of the cause against evil are, are chiefly the king and, and the prophetic figure. So these two. Um, and the priest has not yet come forward because the priest will also be the sacrifice that's made. To some degree, the priest may be seen in the figure of Frodo and the elves or the elves, the uh, hobbits, uh, who's going to bear the burden, have his sort of via dolorosa, walk the way of, uh, of suffering and pain and exile and, uh, and humiliation and, um, and even uh, a abandonment and loss of sight from the world. And nobody sees it coming, least of all, Sauron, who can't imagine that they will try and destroy the Ring of the Power. This is the most foolish thing that anyone could ever do. Why on earth would you do this? And it seems foolish to the whole company 
uh, insofar as they insist on the ways of men, which is the way of greatness, the Beowulf ideal, glory, honor, strength, uh, battle, virtue. That's what is represented by the figure of, um, uh, oh gosh, what's his name? Frodo? No, not Frodo, the man. Uh, Boromir. Sorry? Boromir. Boromir, the mighty man. Uh, he is a Beowulf figure. He is a great man. But it's interesting, and I'll, I'll come to this when we look more specifically about that, uh, Boromir's greatness is acknowledged by Aragorn only at the point where he repents of what he did. That is what Aragorn says that he died a great man, not when he was resisting the, uh, the whole Urukai who came to take uh, the, the uh, hobbits, but when he died and repented for his own evil. Then you were a great man, which is the postulate of a wise king. Remember, Aragorn will not take the ring, and he will not take it anywhere near. Also, he will not guide the company anywhere near the White City, where Boromir wants to go. I would not take, go within 10,000 leagues of your city. He calls it your city, although actually it's his city. So it's very interesting. There's a sense of, in, in uh, relation to Beowulf, where there's no Christian understanding in Tolkien's there is a very much a Christian understanding of the importance of humility and the importance of being incognito remember I said talked about uh, the Deus absconditus the hidden God well here we have Aragorn the hidden hero who is uh, afraid of his own strength because he sees that his own strength is an impediment it, it connects him to the the theology of glory, uh, which will repudiate the cross and the need to die. Um, and I'll, I'll, t I'll talk more about that uh, next time. But the fact that Beowulf dies does not bother Tolkien at all. And he says that there's something great in this. And, uh, and so it becomes a part of his, his own story. And this is the story of men. Men are, are born to die. Oh, did I even bring? I didn't even bring the Lord of the Rings. How does the, how does the beginning of the Lord of the Rings go? What's the jingle? Please. Thank you. I should know it off the top uh, by heart. And I actually do, but I need a prompt to begin it. There's the prologue. Uh, is it there? Oh no, it's concerning hobbits. Oh, maybe it isn't. Where is it? One ring to rule them all, one ring to find them. That's the beginning, that's the end of it. Anyway, uh, it's okay, I can't find it. My apologies. Um, but all that glitters is not gold, right? All those who wander are not lost, something deep roots, not wither, all of them, something like the frost. I, isn't that infuriating? It's nothing worse than botching poetry. Um, but a sense there of a latent or hidden virtue that is going to express itself it, not in defeating his enemy, but in laying down his life in front of the enemy, and yet somehow the enemy being defeated in this. So what does Aragorn do? He le at the very end of the story, at least when he marches to the Black Gate with the company, he goes not to defeat Sauron because he knows that they can't do that. He goes rather just simply to face them and yet has a sense of hope and expectation that though they may come down into ruins, he doesn't think that it will be so. He has hope that they will yet triumph. And the reason he has hope is because of what Frodo is doing behind enemy lines. Uh, to which Sauron is completely ob oblivious and he's not. But he rides out thinking that he is going to die, he and his company are going to die and the dragon, if you will, is going to prevail. And yet it's worth doing. So that sense of the importance of, of death and receiving death well 
and of atonement that an atonement that will come through death is strongly pointed out in Tolkien's work in a way that is never in uh, Beowulf. So it's a much, much more Christian poem than Beowulf for all of the sense that there's no religion in it. Uh, there are no priests, there are no sacrifices, there are no prayers. There's still a strong sense that the poem is thoroughly Christian uh, from beginning to end and Catholic at that. Any comments or questions? Anyway, The Monsters and the Critics, great work, it really is. Uh, and, and seminal in Anglo-Saxon writing as well, it establishes uh, Beowulf as a great poem in its own right, and were it not for Tolkien, it would not have had that standing. That's the measure of his success. By the way, he was brought in to his chair in order to teach Beowulf in Anglo-Saxon, but they only, taught, they only taught the first half. That was his task. It was not, uh, at that point, a serious enough text because people didn't know Anglo-Saxon. So he was teaching it like an ancient language, as you do. When I learned ancient Greek in, in Germany, we, uh, after we got the basics under it, we ended up reading uh, the Iliad just a chapter out of it. And that's just to gain appreciation. That's not even real deep. You're reading it now in the original and appreciating the poem. It's just, and so that's what Tolkien was doing with Beowulf, uh, teaching them the rudiments of the language. But more important than that, it brought him inside the text. And I don't think he ever left the inside of the text. And he was always in the text and he's always in the words. And it became a part of his whole mental framework. And that fit in with what we will call his legendarium then. So let me say something about that. 